What's up guys, and this is Rob TD and Will Higley, and welcome to the TriCast Experience. So, Rob, <sighs> seen any good movies lately? Did you, did you, uh, so do you follow Key and Peele at all? No, do you know I Key don't. and Peele? No, I don't. So Key and Peele, the comedians, uh, they used to have this, like, they did skits on Comedy Central, and then, so, it's, uh, it's, it's like, Key... Keegan something and then Mike or Jordan Peele, Keegan Michael and Michael Keegan and then no Jordan idea Peele. What you're talking about. Right? Okay, well the two guys, right? They're yeah. comedians. So Jordan Peele goes and is like, I want to direct movies, right? So he did Get Out. He's the director of Get Out. Do you ever see that? The horror film that played on like different stereotypes. Oh, I don't watch and it was horror like, films. But it was a horror film directed by a comedian. So it was like, it was. Not necessarily horror, but more of like a comedic thriller. Kind of like scary movie? But not. Okay. Just beautifully done professionally, right? Interesting. So he came out with another movie called Us, right? And... Us? Yeah. <laughs> he came out with this other movie called Us, right? And after watching so many documentaries afterwards and like night show clips and stuff like that where he's talking about the stereotypes that he played on in these movies he went and made another one and it's the same kind of concept of a horror film directed by a comedian that's like one of the most uh, like in society right now it's being talked about a lot because it has so many like social stereotypes that it's playing on so beautifully and there's so many things hidden in it that you go and watch it three or four or five times and you see more and more and more and more and more oh, every that's time really interesting but i think most content that you can consume you can find a lot that you you can consume that the same way Right? Exactly. Like, like, I used to watch House on repeat, and before that, it was How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. You know, I would watch on repeat, just, like, like season after season, then, like, you get done, you start it again, because it's just, mm-hmm. like, what you're falling asleep to. Absolutely. Um, and I'm doing that with Game of Thrones right now, and I'm, like, really starting to get, because now it's, like, my second and a half, third solid watch through, I'm starting to, like, really see, like, these intricate movements that the production crew, the director are all doing to kind of set up the story in more complex ways that like I'm even now aware of it. Like, um, I think it was like in season five, uh, one of the guys makes a, a reference to like just how people die all over the place and how however many places and like people die here, they die there, they die doing this, they die doing that, they die um, squatting over their chamber pots. You know? And like three ses- uh, like episodes later, one of the main guys kills someone on a chamber pot. Huh. And so it's just like, it's really interesting to look at, you know, a developing piece of art in kind of that reflective way. You know, we could even relate that into uh, a lot of the things that we see on art in social media, mm. right? So like, um, you know, hinting at things on a YouTube channel or on uh, social media, and then you see it play out later. Mm. And, um, you know, not everybody might notice it, but you create that, and then that becomes very engaging to an audience at the end of the day. Well, and I think we even know things from our Triangle Company that we've kind of, like, sent in play for, like, a long-term kind of mm-hmm. reveal, right? And I think stuff like that is just... it. It's weird because, like it's one thing that like the creators are doing to kind of have that fun meta relationship with yeah. their audience as well as like it does like create like a quasi extra layer of engagement of like the true fans that like mm-hmm. you know like dubstep before it was cool yeah and you know i see it in like so this one channel that i follow called wolves right on youtube mm. they hinted something in a video almost two years ago and then they brought it back up in a video two years later and it's like hey you remember this if you remember this comment down below like you're the you're the real people you know and um they didn't explain it at all whatsoever, but they told you where to go and find it. And so then that brings you back and you go and search for it two years oh earlier. And yeah. then you can go and watch that video like, oh my, this is what he's talking about. Well, and I think that's that kind of uh, consumption of media. That's really interesting because what people can do is really see like kind of the macro development of a brand. Yeah. Right? Like Gary V starts 
does all his crap, he talks his talk, but then seeing it play out for 10 years of like, oh crap, he's walking the walk, like you really get an extra layer of intimacy with the brand. Yeah, and that's that's really, really cool. And if you really are, you know, I would go into um, like consuming Gary Vee's content, consuming Gary Vee, consuming, you know, Adam Horwitz with the Wolves, consuming yeah. Casey Neistat, consuming Peter McKinnon. I feel like I know these C-Nanners people. Have growing up? Dead. Dude, Scene Hammers was yeah. the <laughs> Yeah, but you feel like you know those people. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, It's like, yeah. I feel like I could go and sit down at lunch with Casey Neistat and I'd know everything about his life, you know? Like, I feel like we've been friends for a long time. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've been friends with Adam Horwitz for a long time, you know? I wonder if that translates into, like, really weird interactions between content creator and audience. Like It probably does. Yeah, if, like, once you reach a certain point, there's got to be a moment of, like, hey, like, don't act like you know me. <laughs> you know, yeah. like that's kind of but, interesting that you say that. Well, or at the very least, it forces the content creator into a certain mindset of where they always have to be prepared for that kind of engagement. Yeah, and but again, that's very engaging content because mm-hmm. I feel like I know them. I feel like you can trust them with what they say, you know. And then they can go and say something like, "Oh, buy my product." I'm like, "Yes, yes." Yeah, so absolutely. If Casey Neistat said anything about cameras, you're gonna believe him. Oh, right? of course. Yeah, like you know, I feel just, like I know him. And I think, like, part of that is just, like, you've spent years with them, you've consumed X amount of content with them, and it's, it's crazy, like, what brands really turn into when you play it out. Absolutely. And that's, you know, kind of what I'm getting to with Will Higley, is I want to create that sort of relationship with my fans, where I am providing that value over and over again, and tenfold, where... I want, I want them to feel like they know me, you know? Yeah. I, I want that relationship. Well, the only way to do that is with just, like, a mountain of content. And Absolutely. that's, like, crazy imposing and hard to do, just, like, in and of itself. Well, yeah, I know. And we talked a little bit about I'm going to go every day on YouTube again. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not going to start. I'm going to start in about uh, a couple months here, you know? But I'm starting to create videos yeah. now to kind of push forth that mountain of content that I'm going to be putting out later. I, I'm i really interested to see how this plays out because it's really going to set up the case study of whether or not Fort Knox actually works as a tactic. Yeah. Right? So, like, when you're rolling it out every day, are you getting authentic engagement? Mm-hmm. Right? Or does it kind of feel weird? Right? Yeah. So, like, that's going to be, like, the, the proof of the pudding. And there's, um... So... Like, I, I can go through so many examples here. Casey Neistat, he really got his name in the... He kind of pioneered the YouTube day vlog, right? Mm. And the way that he did that is he got on a video and said, hey, I'm going to create a video every day for 365 days, oh right? Gosh. Then he did it for four years. That's crazy. You know? Um, I didn't know that... That's, that's how he blew That's up. how he started, because I never was an active follower of Casey. Like, I always saw him, like, interact with, like... Gary V, and even before yeah. I was into Gary V, like he's in those circles. My dad yeah. and brother, like we were really into him. And it's like, oh, like that's neat. Like I used to AV, like that's cool. But like, it, people will have this entire ecosystem of saying that, and like that's really cool. Like to yeah. start that way, I guess that really like just forces it into actualization. You know, of course, and you do that. Um, other examples, you think about um, Gary V, right? He had a podcast, and he did it every. Friday every week for 18 months is that right no I'm not exactly sure on like the the actual format that he did but I know that he had both the ask Gary V show and um, the daily V right? okay and the daily V is obviously I think week daily yeah um but where he really created his platform and brand recognition was through uh, wine library TV yeah. which is what he built um, like wine library uh, family discount liquors off of right and then grew that into like a 60 million dollar business yeah through like content creation so it's like a lot of the things i interact with a lot of people when we talk about content creation content marketing video production is i don't think there's been enough scenarios yet where people just believe it yeah right like how do you build a brand oh it's through creating this. content constantly Every day for a decade. Yeah. Right? That's how you develop a brand for yourself. And because it's like, okay, do this for a decade and I'll check in later. Yeah. 
you know, it's like, well, it, it sounds suspicious, but pointing to like Gary who like built a brand that wasn't even for himself, you know, that's like, I think he ended with a thousand episodes on one library TV. Yeah. That's like nuts, you know, and that can also be, you know, played back into anything, you know, just thinking about YouTubers, you know, we were at that YouTube meeting a couple weeks that's back. That's right, Adventure. Um, and we talked about, you know, from my experience, the quality over quantity on YouTube and then also the 60% rule. You know, oh, sixty percent rule is really interesting, and that's kind of what I learned from studying under a few very successful YouTube creators out there today. Is if you are consistently putting up content, and consistency is you know talking to a lot of different YouTubers. Consistency is the biggest hurdle with I think so YouTube too. creators. Yeah, you know, um, everybody I mean, wants to be creating YouTube habits creator. by nature is just really really difficult. Exactly, you know, Um, and then doing that daily content, you know, some things that help you in that is you have the quantity over quality, you know, and I've seen countless channels grow in that sense with quantity over quality and having that 60% rule. But then there's also, you look at a channel like Peter McKinnon, right? And I don't know if you've dove into any of his videos. You've shown me a couple videos, but I haven't jumped into the ecosystem by myself yet. So he's doing everyday weekday now, and he didn't say anything about it. He just kind of started doing it, right? But really how he blew up is he made one video called like uh, six camera hacks in 60 seconds or something like that. And um, all the way to the top, dude. You know, and uh, his videos are quantity and they also have quality. Yeah. And I think like I'd even say the same for like Gary Vee and other like super, super, super high level brands where it is like both. Right. But something that is like a really neat, like reflective experience piece is to jump back into the original archive of content Mm -hmm. and look at episode one. Yeah, dude. And episode one versus the Instagram video you're watching today of your favorite brand. It's it's mind blowing to see that evolution. Right. And even for me to say, you know, I have all my old hard drives from when I was doing daily on YouTube. My first day was trash, whereas the 40th day going every day was insane awesome. it was yeah, awesome and that's, it was so cool you know and that's i think just the nature of creating content right it's like you have to you can't limit yourself to being fancy when you're not fancy yet yeah so that kind of ties into the 60 percent rule and especially when you're starting out in the beginning using that 60 percent yeah as kind of like a base marker until you move forward and can go to 70 percent and 80 percent and 90 percent you know yeah, I did count that in the right order. <laughs> Good job. Until, until you can do that quantity and quality at the same time. Oh, 100%. And I think at the end of the day, like, you're not going to gain the ability to, like, increase the production quality of your content unless you're making content and seeing the data that comes back from it. And the only way to, to get that data is to release content. Right? Absolutely. So like this is like a ladder that you're going to be able to build, but the only way to like actually build the ladder is by putting the content out and like being okay with crap quality until it's not. Exactly. And that's, you know, again, that's where the 60% rule really comes into play right there. And I thought that was interesting that at the YouTube meetup at Venture the other week, I brought up the 60% rule and nobody had ever heard of it before. Which is really, really weird because you'd think that people who are literally making content every day, like that's something that they're basing their lives around. But it seems that they're just going through the extra like crazy nitpicky time of creating content versus which extends any piece of content like it's going to take days to put out versus hours absolutely and that's kind of where i was when i started was i don't want to do a video i i don't like the color of my teeth i don't like how my hair looks today i don't like how i don't like what i'm talking about i'm not doing anything cool i'm not going to pull out the camera you know it's all the way in my bag and i'm on today's podcast we're talking about will's insecurities yeah basically (laughs) You know, all of that, the the nitty gritty, that all disappeared when the 60% rule came into play. Yeah, because you either perform or you lose. Absolutely. That's a really, you know, that is a harsh, savage way to put that, but that's exactly true. Yeah. You know, um, let's see, what else do we want to touch on right here? I mean, I'm running out of time, so let's do a hot take 
Um, what is the next social media platform that you're paying attention to? So the next one I'm paying attention to, and you've kind of turned me on to this as well, is TikTok, right? Yeah. So there are there's like increasingly and increasingly amounts of great content on TikTok, and we're seeing all sorts of advertisements for it, trying to bring people to that platform. Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of platforms come in and out here in you know, maybe the past year, you know, you've seen a lot of ads for this platform or that platform or Justin's called me and said like, dude, check out this new platform. And then yeah. I never hear anything about it yeah. again. You and know? I think that I'm just kind of looking at the same indicators that like past platforms have developed before they got big. Absolutely. Like DJ Khaled was the reason Snapchat became Snapchat because mm-hmm. he started like playing yeah. with it. Absolutely. And now that he just jumped in and did an actual like true blue endorsement of TikTok, I'm like, okay, this is about to become mainstream within the next three months. Yeah. And then there's also the argument that all of these platforms, you know, you have the, um, what is the word that you keep saying? Um, you have the omni-channel. Omni-channel strategy. Yeah. So right. as many places as you can possibly be. So find your audience and wherever they is, make content for them. But there's also the argument, and I heard this as well, studying under Brendan Amato from the Wolves, was when a new platform comes out, you want to be the first one on there. Oh, because yeah. if first, you are the first one on there, first no matter where everything. that platform goes, yeah. you know? So right when TikTok came out, I should have been the first one on that platform, you, you know? Um, so, just like, for example, Jory was one of the first people on that <laughs> platform and grew to over a thousand in a week, right? Mm-hmm. And I think just because there's so much... There's not enough supply right now that any demand on the platform, you can really, really climb that ladder really fast. And it's not too late for you to get on TikTok either. Exactly. But I'm willing like to say that like young brands need to take their time, learn it, become an expert, put out that content, but know that they're not gonna if they missed that first mover advantage be diligent about it, create that content on that platform, but don't expect to be DJ Khaled on Snapchat. Of course. Right? But use a developing center like this to kind of get that brand exposure and brand growth for you so that when the next thing comes around, you're then locked and loaded and ready to go. And see, that's also the argument of like, I wasn't the first one on Instagram. You know, Instagram was around way before I got on Instagram. I think Instagram, Instagram was around like 10 years before I got on it. Exactly, you know? So it's it's not to say that you cannot grow on a platform that already has a ton of people on it, Yeah. you know? Um, it's to say that it might be easier on a new platform, especially yeah. if that takes off. And at the end of the day, like, platforms are evolving every day. Like, right now, LinkedIn is super, super, exactly. super frothy on organic reach. And, like, that's something that I'm getting us to the point where we we can take advantage of that but i know it's not going to happen every night because infrastructure is built slowly rome wasn't built in the day exactly exactly thanks so much for joining us today on this tricast experience bar talk Uh, bar talk i love it uh, that's great i'm rob td i'm will higley and thanks so much catch you later and inquiries comments concerns dm us we can't wait to hear from you Peace. peace